Let's join together in prayer this morning. Dear Lord, thank you for bringing us into your house again. Thank you for the wonderful things going on in this community. Bless ever those who are traveling and working for your glory this week, Lord. Bless us and um, for all that we do, Lord, bless us in our prayers to you. Bless us this week that we follow your will, Lord, and not only what we do, but how we do it. We ask this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Our scripture call to worship this morning is Psalm 146, Psalm 146. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God all my life long. Do not put your trust in princes, in mortals, in whom there is no help. When their breath departs, they return to the earth. On that very day, their plans perish. Happy are those whose help is God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord, their God, who made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, who keeps fate forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the strangers. He upholds the orphans and the widow, but the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. The Lord will reign forever. Your God, O Zion, for all generations. Praise the Lord. Hey, good morning, Williams. Let's get the music going, shall we? Let's all stand as we rejoice during this great song. 473, if you need your book. I think you know this one, though. It's Victory in Jesus. Let's sing it out, okay? Let's sing it. I heard an old, old story How a Savior came Sounding good this morning. Everyone can be seated. Choir, you can be seated, but let's keep the music going. Hymn number 470. I love this great hymn. It talks about the footsteps of Jesus. Let's keep singing out.
favorite verse, sing the last. Then at last singing children you can make your way down to the front <laughs> Jesus care. Does Jesus care for us? He does? How do you know that Jesus cares for us? Hmm, maybe because we had food this morning? Yeah? Maybe because when we look around, what do we see outside? We see beautiful flowers, flowers and trees that help us breathe. At night, what, what do we have the privilege of seeing? Because we live in the country. We can look up and see the beautiful stars. stars. Aren't those all good reminders that Jesus cares? Yes. Yeah. Does he care for us even when we're having a hard time? No. Yeah, that's when he cares the most. When we're having those hard times and when we're down a little bit, Jesus is still there and he still cares for us. In our story today, Jesus was making his way to a town called Nain. And you know what happened when he got to Nain? He saw somebody having a funeral. And guess what? It was a little boy of a mom. And that was her only son. And she wasn't married or anything else. And that mom was very upset. But you know what? Jesus cared so much that he touched that boy. And guess what? The boy lived. And he got to go back with his mom. And they got to live together a little bit more time. Jesus gave them more time together as a family. And they got to have that. That was Jesus' way of showing he's cared. Do you know another way that Jesus showed that he cares for us? What did Jesus do that showed that he cared for us? How did he do that? What was the big thing we learned about a few weeks ago? Two months ago? Jesus died on a cross. Yeah, isn't that pretty caring? Would you just go down a cross just for anybody? No, well, Jesus died on the cross for you and me to show how much he loves us and how much he cares uh, about us. So when we go through this week and we're thinking, we get kind of lonely or we ever get to that point where nobody cares. Well, guess what? Somebody does care. Jesus always cares for us. And he cared so much for us that he gave his life so that we could have him in our hearts and that we could live forever and ever. I say our prayer this morning. Dear God, we just thank you so much. Thank you so much for your love and your care and all that you do. We just pray that we can remember that as we go this week. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. Everybody's going to that. Amen. Philippians 3.14 says, I press on toward the goal 
to win the prize. Hymn number 399 says it like this. I'm pressing on to higher ground. Let's remain seated as we sing this. We'll stand on the last verse, okay? Let's sing it. I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day, still praying as I'm onward bound, Lord plant my feet on higher ground, Lord lift me up and let me stand, by faith on heaven's table land, a higher the third verse. I want to live above the world, though Satan's darts at me are hurled, for faith has caught the joyful sound, the song of saints on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand, by faith on heaven's table land, a higher Stand with me as we sing out on this last verse. I want to scale the utmost high and catch a gleam of glory bright, but still I'll pray till heaven I found. Lord, lead me on to higher. Sing it. Lord, lead me Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you again so much for this day, during all the blessings that you've given to us in life. We're thankful for the rain that we have today. Just let it quench our earth right now, dear Lord. We pray for those away from us, dear Lord, who are traveling, those who are doing your will. Lord, we just ask now that we pause to give back, that you give us, uh, uh, give us hearts just full of joy and full of love, dear Lord, to give back to you and take these offerings, dear Lord. Bless them to the building of your kingdom. For we ask it in thy name. Amen.
Let's stand. Praise God from whom all blessings seated. Before the choir sings, Lamar is going to come up and introduce our speaker for this morning. Good morning. It's my pleasure this morning to introduce our, our guest pastor for the day, uh, Dr. Pat McFadden. Uh, he is a native in, of South Carolina, a graduate of Clemson University and Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary in Fort Worth, Texas. He has a Master's of Divinity and a doctor of ministry. Uh, he's pastored churches in Texas and Alabama. Um, he's been a missionary to Santo Domingo uh, in the Dominican Republic. Married to Sue Whitmore, Whit Whitmire uh, McFadden of Fife, Alabama. Uh, she was a former Act Teams director for Alabama WMU. Uh, Pat, he was, Pat was the pastor of First Baptist Church of Fort Payne for 27 years, where he retired in 2014. Uh, he serves as adjunct instructor of religion at Northeast Alabama Community College. They have uh, two uh, grown children and four grandchildren. So please join me in a Williams welcome for Dr. McFadden. He'll come after the choir special for his message today. Thanks.
Indeed, He is here. And I'm glad to be here. And He's with me and with you and we're with each other. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lamar, for that introduction and all of you for that warm welcome. I met several of you a few minutes ago and I, I sense something warm and something special here. By the way, thank you for that offertory. Was that a Fanny J. Crosby tune? Uh, tail by the nail prints in his hand. I appreciate the musicians. I, I must say something about Pat and uh, Linnell, is it? And you've been married, what, about a week or less? And you're in church? <laughs> and you're directing music? I had a wedding a couple of weeks ago at a sheep farm. You know, they get married on farms and in uh, barns these days. And I need to tell them, and I have a couple of them on the horizon coming up, I need to tell them about Pat and Linnell and the examples that you're setting. But it's good to be with you. I must say this is my first time here at First Baptist Church Williams. Though I do know about you and your, your faithful service and history and your exemplary Baptist heritage, and I appreciate that. Your pastor, Chris, is a man of faith. I'll tell you why. An example of faith. Because you see, Chris and I have really never met. We just became uh, friends on Facebook and we've emailed a time or two and I talked to him on the phone one time. But a mutual acquaintance in Birmingham gave him my name and he stepped out on faith. As far as I know, he's never heard me preach. And when I was pastoring First Baptist Fort Payne for 27 years, I was kind of particular about who I shared my pulpit with. Now, this is the Lord's pulpit, and it is a sacred place. But that preacher, that pastor, is responsible for this. And I saw, I said, Chris, I promise you, I'll try to keep the damage to a minimum <laughs> instead of people coming through and, and going on. I feel kind of like the little boy who fell into a big barrel of molasses he said, oh, Lord, please give me a mouth worthy of this occasion. <laughs> so that's what I pray. Lord, give me a mouth worthy of this occasion. If you have a Bible, let's turn together to the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 14, verses 10 through 22. Exodus chapter 14, 10 through 22. The text for the message that I'm calling, Keep Moving. Keep Moving. By the way, Sue is here with me. She's kind of near the back right back there, and when we visit other churches, uh, whether I'm preaching or I'm not preaching, I kind of, like most Baptists, I sit near the back. And so she's gotten into that uh, routine as well, and she's been with me here today. And uh, thank you for your hospitality to us all. Exodus, the second book of the Bible, the second book of what we call in Old Testament studies the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament. Tradition says that Moses is the author. We do know for sure that this is just as much a part of the God-breathed word of the Lord as any other portion of Scripture. And Exodus is a book of redemption. It's a book of being set free. It's a book of mission where God's people were redeemed or set free from Egyptian bondage and slavery and called to be His special people and the tool of God, the light of the world for that time. And so we'll look at that in just a minute. I'm calling it uh, Keep Moving. We must keep moving physically, mentally, and spiritually, or else we'll be left behind. Ida Keeling is 102 years old. She lives in New York. She said that a secret to her long life is she keeps moving. I never want to look backwards, she said. I'm a forward type of person. My doctor said one time, Pat, if you want to keep moving, you better keep moving. Somebody said kind of jokingly, half jokingly, if we don't use this gray matter, it may not matter when we get gray. And if we don't keep moving spiritually as God's people, we might be left behind of what God is doing and wants to do in our lives and in our churches. So keep moving. Please hear and follow along with me the reading of God's Word in Exodus chapter 14, 10 through 22. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up, and there were the Egyptians marching after them. 
they were terrified and cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us to the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, Leave us alone, let us serve the Egyptians? It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. Moses answered the people, Do not be afraid. Stand firm, and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring to you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. And then the Lord said to Moses, Why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. In the Hebrew language, that means tell them to keep moving. Keep on keeping on. Raise your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water so that the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them. And I will gain glory through Pharaoh and all his army, through his chariots and his horsemen. The Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I gain glory through Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. Then the angel of, the, of God who had been traveling in front of Israel's army, withdrew and went behind them. The pillar of cloud also moved in from front and stood behind them, coming between the armies of Egypt and Israel. Throughout the night, the cloud brought darkness to the one side and light to the other, so that neither went near the other all night long. And then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and all that, that night the Lord drove the sea back with a strong wind and turned it into dry ground. The waters were divided, and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on the right and on the left. Well, I have just read to you the background of one of the most momentous, magnificent, supernatural events in all of Scripture. What the cross of Christ and the resurrection of Jesus Christ are to us. The exodus and the passing through the Red Sea were to the people of the Old Testament. This is the high watermark. This is the peak experience of the Old Testament. Everything in the Old Testament revolves around this redemption, this exodus experience. This is the epitome of the supernatural, of the miraculous, of the special. And do you know what it's about? Do you really know what this story is about? It's about keeping on. Keeping on. Keep moving. Don't quit. God is not finished with you yet. In the city of Wichita Falls, Texas, there is an ordinance on the books entitled Failure to Maintain Locomotion. It was put on the books in the early days of the Old West to keep the prostitutes off the street. It's still on the books in Wichita Falls today, not for that purpose, but to disperse crowds. When a crowd gathers without permission or permit, they turn to this ordinance, failure to maintain locomotion, to disperse that crowd. And when I read this story, I thought about that idea, that it just might be that the number one problem of us as God's people is a failure to maintain locomotion, to keep moving. Did you know that just about every symbol for the kingdom of God in Scripture, every command of the kingdom of God has to do with motion, locomotion, such as light travels, water flows, cookie crumbles, the ball bounces, the Mercedes bends, Motion. There you go. Now you're waking up a little bit. You caught a little bit of my dry humor there. Failure to maintain locomotion. Did you know that the two greatest commandments of God to us as His people have to do with locomotion? Movement. Come and go. Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest into your souls. Come now, come, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Whoever comes to me, I will no wise cast out. Come unto me and be saved. Come and go. 
Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. As you go, preach. So come and go. And if we are alive, we must maintain some sense of movement. If we are alive spiritually, there must be some sense of locomotion. Now, I don't know what your crisis is today. But I tell you what, through years of ministry, I've learned that there is usually a crisis or a hurt or a problem or a decision somewhere on just about every row. It might be the loss of a loved one. It might be a bad health report. It might be a financial problem or a marital problem or a wayward children. And what we try to do is we try to take the principles, the commands, and the promises of Scripture and apply it to that particular situation. So what was the crisis or what is the crisis of these people of whom I just read? Well, you know that they were in Egyptian bondage and slavery for more than 400 years. The horribleness, the terrible enslavement, starvation, beatings, murders. And for years and years, they called out to God. And God was silent. It seemed, what do you do when God seems to be silent? You keep on keeping on. You keep hoping. You keep trusting. You keep moving on. And God says, I'm working a work among you such as you would not believe even if I told you. Well, they had experienced the plagues that the Lord had sent upon Pharaoh and the Egyptians to release his people. You know, the water turned to blood and the darkness crossed the land and the disease of, of uh, people and the cattle throughout the land and the frogs and the locusts and all that and the death of the firstborn in every Egyptian household. Well, they had celebrated the Passover feast and the death angel had passed over the homes of those Hebrew people and now they were moving out. Two million Jews all under the command of General Moses. And the mountains were to the north and the Red Sea was before them and the desert was behind them. And all of a sudden somebody must have screamed out they saw this dust cloud coming. And they began to scream that it, was Mo, that it was Pharaoh, Pharaoh and his army. And they were caught between a rock and a hard place. And they would perish out there in the desert. And they began to complain and gripe and mumble to Moses, What did you get us into this type of situation for, Moses? Moses learned something that every preacher knows, that every coach knows. While we all know it. You can't please all of the people any of the time or any of the people all of the time. Moses, what have you done to us? And they began to complain and mumble. I've heard people say, if I lived in biblical times, it would have been so much easier to believe and to obey. No, it wouldn't. If we can't be faithful in this time, it would not have made any difference if we'd walked along with those Hebrew people. If we had been in this group, we might have complained just like Moses. Now, Moses, what have you gotten us in this situation for? You see, they weren't taking the most direct route to the promised land. That would have been through the land of Philistia straight ahead. Instead, they were taking a circular route. And if we had been in that, following that group, part of that group, and if we had seen that we were in this kind of a Custer's last stand, little bighorn type situation, we probably would have complained out loud to Moses as well. What are you doing to us? And they grumbled and they complained. Let me tell you something that's dangerous. As far as the New Testament is concerned, this mumbling and grumbling and complaining about the things of God is sin. Sin like murder is sin. Sin like stealing is sin and lying is sin and covetousness is sin. Here they were on the verge of the greatest experience of freedom they would ever experience. And they grumbled and they complained and they couldn't see it. We're like that sometimes, aren't we? We're right on the verge of perhaps a new experience with the Lord, a new renewal or revival in our lives and in our church or some sort of blessing, but we're so close, just a step or two away, but we can't see it because our faith is weak and our faith is not aggressive enough. 
Instead of majoring on the opportunity, what do we do? We think about the obstacle. Instead of putting our eyes on the possibility, we look at the problem. And we're missing out. Right on, maybe your church is right on the verge of some great experience if our faith is just aggressive enough. I'll tell you about those kind of people. You don't have any like that here, do you? In the Jacksonville area. You Gamecocks, y'all don't have that kind of fun. By the way, by the way, I'll just be honest with you. You are the only Gamecocks that I ever pulled for. If you, if you kind of get my drift here. But you don't have anybody like that around this community, do you? I'll tell you about those kind of people. They multiply faster than clothes hangers in your closet. And I'll tell you something else. I don't think I've ever buried a single one of them. They seem to live forever. Moses, what have you done to us? It would have been better if you had left us alone and let us die. At least there was a grave for us all in Egypt. And they complained and murmured. Let me tell you something about us, we human beings. Whenever we face a crisis or a decision or a problem, you know what we have the tendency to do is to look back to the past. And when we look back to the past, we have a tendency to romanticize the past like they were doing. How many of you have been to Colorado? Any of you been to Colorado and see those beautiful white snow uh, peaked Rocky Mountains. I've been to Colorado one time. There's a, a girl from Fort Payne who moved out there, wanted to get married, and wanted us to come out and perform her ceremony in the snow. And I'd never been there, and I certainly was not a skier, but I borrowed all this kind of, of snow uh, skiing clothes and from everything, you know, gloves and, and the pants and the shoes. And we went out there and stood in the snow on a rather sunny day in the snow, we performed that ceremony. And then they hopped into a helicopter that was sitting right here, and they went off to one of those uh, snow-covered mountain peaks, and they would drop them off up there, and they'd ski down, and they'd pick them up and take them back up, heli-skiing, as they called it. And the wedding party, with the exception of yours truly, went heli-skiing. But if you've ever been out there in the spring or summer, you've seen those snow-covered peaks. But if you get right up close to them, they're not so white. They are dirty brown. Because the farther off we are from some experience, the better it seems. In my ministry, I was invited to and I attended a number of 50th wedding anniversaries. And I still do. And they all were about the same. The friends and family came with, with uh, gifts and good cheer and love and refreshments galore. And, and uh, the happy couple sometimes were seated like a king and queen on their joining thrones. King and queen. See, y'all got a lot to look forward to there. And uh, she had on a big, would have on a big uh, uh, corsage and he would have on a, a big boutonniere and might be sitting there pulling on his, the knot of his tie, feeling kind of uncomfortable and shuffling his feet. And then a couple of things always happen. I, as the preacher, was always asked to pray. Now, I don't know why they kept asking me to pray. Maybe to pray for forgiveness for the first 50 years, I don't know, or for grace for the next few years. But I'd pray, you know, and I'd stand there in my best pastoral pose and I'd pray a nice prayer for them. And then something else would happen. Somebody would say, speech. And she would look to him and she would kind of pat him on the hand, you know, his wrist, and he'd kind of <clears throat> clear his throat and his necktie and he'd shuffle his feet and he would say something like, well, Mama and I never had an argument. <laughs> and I'm standing there thinking, now I know I don't hear as well as I used to hear but it seems to me somebody is dealing rather loosely with the truth here or maybe senility has come in. You see, the farther away we are from the experience, we look back and we romanticize that. Oh, those were the good old days. Well, let me tell you what. Every day is a good old day. 
We look back to the past through like rose-colored glasses sometimes. Every generation, from baby boomers like me to Generation X, the millenniums, every day is special. You know what happens when we look back too much? It shows how we're getting older. And there's nothing wrong with that. Churches are that way too. We have a tendency to look back and say, oh, I remember when we did it this way. Or the seven last words of the church. We never did it that way before. I'm a nostalgic person. I really do. I like to remember when I can some things. Appreciate the past. But you know what? I learned a long time ago, especially as pastor, if I don't keep moving and looking forward, God's going to bypass me and leave me and at that time my church behind. Paul said, forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forth into those things which are before, I press on toward. That's an that's a athletic term. I press on toward. I'm running toward the goal of the prize or the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Keep moving. And I say to this to you out of great respect. There might be somebody here who has not made it one mile spiritually since you were saved. Keep moving. God is not finished with you yet. History is important. It's important in our town. It's important around here. I guess I appreciate history now more than ever before, even in my school days. I read probably more of it now than ever before. But if we just major on the past, and if we were to put a historical placard on our church doors, that would be the most dangerous thing we could ever do. Keep moving. How many of you have been to, to Europe? Did you see the, uh, those big cathedrals all through Europe? Those massive, beautiful cathedrals testifying to an age of splendor and grandeur and power years gone by but you'll stay there a mighty long time before you'll ever get a crowd in any of them anymore because they have been left behind. I used to say until a few years ago that I was a middle-aged man until my wife a few years ago asked me, how many people do you know 130 years old? <laughs> I'm not. Anymore. I am who I am. God meets us at every step of the way where we are. Keep moving. He is not finished with you individually or as a church yet. We're made to keep moving. Our eyes point forward. Our arms and hands point forward. Our feet point forward. Our ears point forward. forward. When I learned to drive, somebody said, back up as little as possible. If you have an accident backing up, guess whose fault it probably is. Cars aren't made to go backwards. They're made to go forward. We go backwards so that we can go forward. And in the Second World War, Generals MacArthur and Patton never used the term retreat. They called it strategic withdrawal, looking forward. In Fort Payne, there's a nursing home called Crown Health. And there was this lady that was a resident of Crown Health. And one day she was sitting in the day room or the sun room or the guest room, wherever they, they gather to receive visitors. And she kept looking at this man. This man had come there to visit somebody. And every time he looked up, this lady was looking at him, staring at him. Now that would make me uncomfortable. He didn't know her. And every time he looked up, she was just staring at him right in the eyes. Well, as he was preparing to leave, he walked by her, and she was just looking at him, and he got up nerve to stop, and he said, Ma'am, I'm sorry, but why are you staring at me so? I don't believe we know each other, do we? And she said, Oh, sir, I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to make you feel uncomfortable, but you look like my third husband. <laughs> he said, Well, how many husbands have you had? She said, Two. <laughs> I guess that's looking forward. I guess that's positive thinking. I don't know. The Lord says, I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for good and not evil, to give you a future and a hope. Keep moving. 
my friends. Now, I'll tell you what happened at the end of this story, but first I want to remind you of the little boy, well, not little boy, the young student from the south who went to one of those theological schools up north. Now, I am for theological higher education. I'm for Christian higher education. The Lord can use a trained mind. You wouldn't go to a doctor that wasn't trained, would you? Well, he'd gone up there, and a lot of those colleges up north began in the Baptist tradition, you know. Kind of got away from it. Well, anyway, he was up there and kind of got a little bit, a little bit too more, too much to the left. And he came back home and visited his grandfather. His grandfather, you know, was sitting on the front porch and he was reading this very story. He hollers out, Hallelujah, praise the Lord. What are you reading, granddaddy? Man, I'm reading about how God parted those waters and then drowned Pharaoh's army. Oh, granddaddy. You don't really believe that, do you? Granddaddy, don't you know that Hebrew word translated Red Sea could also mean the Sea of Reeds? And the Sea of Reeds was right up there on the northwest corner of the Red Sea, and it was about four inches deep. And Granddaddy, the wind would blow and the the ripples would come across that water. And Granddaddy, they they just embellished that story so much until finally they had that water standing several feet high. You don't believe that, do you, Granddaddy? Granddaddy thought a while, four inches of water. Hallelujah, praise God. He drowned Pharaoh's army in four inches of water, (laughs) Granddaddy said. If you think that I or anybody else embellished this, listen to Psalm 77, verse 13 and following. Psalm 77. Your ways, O God, are holy. What God is so great is our God. You are the God who performs miracles. You display your power among the people. With your mighty arm, you redeemed your people, the descendants of Jacob and Joseph. The waters saw you, O God. The waters saw you and writhed. The very depths were convulsed. The clouds poured down water. The skies resounded with thunder. Your arrows flashed back and forth. Your thunder was heard in the whirlwind. Your lightning lit up the world. The earth trembled and quaked. You... Your path led through the sea, your way through the mighty waters, though your footprints were not seen. You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. And that storm came in, that tornado or hurricane or cyclone, depending upon where it touched ground. And God said, Moses, you raise your staff. And Moses raised that staff up. And that cloud moved from in front of the people of Israel and got between them and the Egyptian army. And Moses held that staff up and that wind blew and blew and blew until those waters in a supernatural, miraculous way were just parted like this up high. But the miracle was just not that. The miracle was two million Jews passed through on dry ground and then those waters convulsed back down on Pharaoh and his army. But that's not the end of the story. I think Moses looked down, or God looked down to Moses and said, okay, Moses, keep moving. You're not there yet. Head them up. Move them out. Keep moving. Well, my friend, I don't know what your Red Sea is today. It might be a decision that you're facing. It might be a health issue financial, whatever. But keep moving. Keep trusting. With God, nothing is impossible. He is not finished with you yet. And He will pardon, part your waters and you'll come out on the other side. Keep moving. Would you pray with me, please? A part of keep moving is to make a decision, a choice. Well, Lord, I'm going to move on from this day forward with you. We're going to sing this hymn in just a minute. 376, I've decided to follow Jesus. Would you be willing to move either outwardly or inwardly in your heart as we decide to follow him today? Thank you, dear Lord, that you're the God of of might, the God of supernaturalness, the God of miracles, but the God of love. Help us to keep moving until we see you face to face. Amen. 376, I've decided to follow Jesus, our hymn of choice.
message. And please be with us and have us look to you as, as we move forward as a church and as individuals as we continue to try to serve you. We thank you so much for the safe travels of our mission team to the Rio Grande Valley. We ask that you give them a good week in ministry and a safe trip home so they can return and report to us next week. We ask you that you be with all of us.